Oh my God, you guys are gonna make me cry. Well, welcome to Close Horse, the podcast that just took to Advil because I've literally been standing all day and my feet are gonna fall off. But here we are, and to Advil, I'm gonna get through this. I'm your host, my name is Amanda, and this is the first ever episode of Close Horse in front of a live studio audience. We're doing this here in beautiful Lancaster, Pennsylvania at West Art. And this is the last part of the first ever, and I was saying for a while the only, but possibly just the first ever, one of hopefully many, Closed Horse Jamboree. All right, so uh, we're going to be doing things a little bit differently than we do a lot of Closed Horse episodes tonight, which is we're going to be doing a talk show format. We're talking Ricky. We're talking Sally. We're talking Phil Donahue. We're probably not talking Jenny Jones. Anyway, that means I'm going to be bringing guests up here. I'm going to chit-chat with them a little bit, ask them some questions, then I'm going to come out to you in the audience to get your questions. Now... We're talking about something that evokes a lot of emotion tonight. So I would just ask that you are respectful and kind to our guests or Dustin's going to fight you. So you don't, you don't want that. Um, all right. So what are we talking about tonight that made me have to give you that disclaimer? Well, I just want to hear from all of you. Um, have any of you ever heard about or been on the internet? Right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, how about this? Um, how many of you have ever been in a fight with someone on the internet? Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as far as I see it, the internet's good for shopping, looking at cute animals, hooking up, and fighting with strangers, right? And one of the things people love to fight about, well, like, to be honest, let's be real, there are approximately one million things we can fight about on the internet at every given moment. Isn't technology amazing? Remember when you would just have to pick a fight with someone next to you and it like it would use a lot of imagination to get there? Now we can just fight with strangers about any number of topics. And I thought I would get started with what, in my opinion, right now are the top five fashion and clothing topics that people like to fight about on the internet. Can I get a little bit of a drum roll here from y'all? All right, all right. Number five, no-show socks. Bad, unforgivable, or so ugly they're cute. You know, like, like basset hounds, right? Um, number four, skinny jeans. Badge of shame or badge of honor? Number three, this is one that actually really brings out the hardcore fighters. Is the anthropology fast fashion? Can I hear from you all? What's the answer there? Thank you. I taught you well. Okay, number two. This one, this one brings out the death threats, ironically. Vegan leather is plastic. A classic, right? True, but let's fight about it anyway. And number one, and this is what we're here to talk about tonight. Who is allowed to buy and sell secondhand clothing? God, we really do live in a lucky time where we can just fight just about just in anything, right? Like, how lucky are we? When I say it out loud, why would we ever fight about who can wear secondhand clothing, right? Okay, so before we start bringing some guests up here and dissecting that topic, I just wanted to get down to brass tacks about why this is an important topic. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay some really depressing stuff on you for a few minutes, okay? So everybody take a deep breath, take a drink of water, get ready to hear some depressing shit because um, we got to get started with that. So first things first, there is just too much clothing in this world, right? The average American buys 70 new items of clothing every year. And I know what you're thinking Socks, individual socks don't count, okay? Um, and if you are a person who is a nudist or hasn't bought new clothes since you were born or I, I don't know what you're doing, you never buy clothes, I want to remind you that if you bought zero items of clothing last year, that means someone else bought 140 because that's how averages work, right? And 
you say it out loud and you're like, wow, 140 articles of clothing in a year. It must be just like all you do full time is look for clothes to buy. But the reality is that we don't live in that world anymore. You can never leave your couch. You could buy, I, I, I haven't challenged myself to this because this is a really bad idea, but maybe one of you wants to try it. You could sit down and I bet in a few hours on your couch, you could buy 140 items of clothing. And you know what would be even better? You'd get free shipping. You'd probably get a little discount, right? So you'd be like, you know what? What's 140? That's amateur hour. Let's do 210, 280. What the hell? What's a checking account? It doesn't matter, right? The point is it's so easy to get a lot of clothing. So that's one problem we're dealing with right now, which is just people are buying a lot of brand new clothing. But on top of that, the industry is churning out all this clothing every year between 100 and 150 billion garments each year. And yes, I know what you're thinking. Individual socks don't count. Quit trying to lawyer me on that one. And 150 billion garments every year. There's only 8 billion people on this planet. I look it up all the time just to see if it changed. The math doesn't math, or it does math in that, like, wow, there's way too much clothing. And we know 60% of the clothing that is made in a given year ends up in the landfill the very same year. There's too much clothing. Are you guys depressed yet? We're getting there, right? (laughs) According to the British Textile Council, there are actually enough clothes on the planet right now as we're sitting here to clothe the next six generations of humans. And we were talking about this yesterday at the Jamboree, sort of like, what span of time is six generations? Is that a century? Is that a century and a half? Here we are, we already have enough clothing for all those people. What does that mean, right? Can we right side all of this? The answer is we can. And it means that we have to buy 75% less new clothing, which if you don't have a calculator in your pocket at all times like me, not currently though, actually, this dress has no pockets, hashtag fast fashion. Um, But (laughs) if we are on average buying 70 new items of clothing every year, and now we we have to buy 75% less, that's 15. Once again, individual socks don't count, but you're probably glad about that, right? When I said 15, because you were like, wait, I can only get seven and a half pairs of no-show socks? Like, what's going to happen? And so, yes, we need to buy a lot less new clothing. And what does that mean? It means we need everybody, regardless of size, age, how much money they have, where they live, what their aesthetic is. We need everybody shopping secondhand most of the time for at least really the next six generations or longer. And yet here we are so frequently fighting about the ethics of secondhand, who's allowed to buy it and who's allowed to sell it. I've seen it all on the internet. Only poor people should shop at thrift stores. Rich people, I'm not sure what they're supposed to buy, but they should never be at thrift stores. Now, to be fair, I've never seen a limousine at a thrift store but I'd be pretty stoked. And we also hear, we we hear a lot of bad things about resellers, right? I'm going to throw some things that I see every time I open any app. Resellers steal clothing from poor people. Resellers take all the good stuff. Resellers are bad people who are out to scam everyone. And so on and so on and so on. Well, let's talk about resellers for a little bit, right? Because I was saying, hey, we all need to buy most of our clothes secondhand. And guess what? It's kind of like, I say this all the time, it's the golden era of shopping secondhand. Because many of us will remember a time, um, those are the same people who laughed at my Jenny Jones joke, that we will remember a time when the only place you could buy secondhand clothing was like a thrift store or a yard sale, right? Maybe a vintage store, a consignment store, but you know, those aren't everywhere. Now we can, there are even more thrift stores, even more consignment shops, even more places to buy clothes secondhand in real life. And we have buy nothing groups and Facebook marketplace and places where we can meet up with people in our community and get secondhand clothing. But beyond that, there are approximately nine gazillion apps and websites 
where we can also shop secondhand. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the economy of that, like how it works. So there are two different kinds of online platforms for buying and selling clothing. The first are these ones where a company has people send in their stuff in a box or a mailer, and then they take responsibility of sorting through all that stuff, of measuring it, of taking photos. By the way, the thread up Reddit is solid gold for bloopers of photography if you're ever looking for a laugh. Um, you know, they, they take responsibility for all that. The stuff that people send in that possibly has poop on it, which also happens according to Reddit, uh, they deal with that too. And they dispose of the garbage and they ship out the orders and they deal with the customer service and all this stuff. And guess what? None of them make any money. In fact, well, the real real did turn a slight profit in Q4 of last year. ThreadUp lost $72 million last year because they can't make the math math, right? Think about the expenses of reselling secondhand clothing on the internet. We've got inbound shipping when the customers send it in. We've got paying people to unpack those orders and sort out what's good. We have people measuring, doing copy, taking photos, launching it on the website, doing customer service, shipping those orders out, and so much more. And that that's a lot of work, right? And it costs a lot of money. On the other side of that equation, we have the platforms that are what are called peer-to-peer, meaning one person selling clothes to someone else or anything else secondhand, really. And in that situation, the person who already owns the item takes the photos, cleans the item, repairs it, writes the listing, posts it, does the customer service, and ships out the order. And those platforms actually make a ton of money because they are not really selling anything, but they're charging people to be there, right? And this is actually one of the fundamental economic flaws within the secondhand model as it exists right now, which we're going to talk about more after this. Um, But ultimately, while I don't see resellers sitting around saying, oh my God, I lost $72 million last year, the reality is that a lot of these people are working for free or very little money at all. And I see people nodding their heads out there because they because they know, right? Yet here we are on the internet, we're fighting about resellers all the time and how they're getting rich and they're ripping people off and they're scamming people and they're just terrible people and they're ruining everything. Um, and it's been going around for a while. So last year... Alex of St. Evans reached out to me and said, hey, people are literally fighting on the internet nonstop about who's allowed to buy and sell secondhand. What if we did an episode about that? And I'm going to tell you that when we started working on it, I was like, you know, I've heard a lot of these things too, that resellers are driving up prices in thrift stores and they take clothing from poor people and they're scamming people and all this other stuff. And I don't know if it's true, but I've heard it so often. Maybe it is. And I will tell you, four episodes later, that's how many we recorded, hundreds of hours of research and writing and recording and editing and all those things later, I realized all of that stuff was bullshit, right? They're all myths. So I felt, and you know, I don't think of myself as someone with like a huge ego, but I was like, pretty sure that Alex and I nailed it. We did it all. We're done. Everyone will hear it. The world will change and we can move on. But here we are a year later. We're still fighting about it, right? We're still seeing the same thing over and over again. So I think it's time for us to revisit this conversation again. And fortunately, my first guest tonight is Alex of St. Evans, and we're going to break this down again. So come on up, Alex. Sorry, Alex. I just ad-libbed six cards, and I just want to say how proud I am of myself. (laughs) I will just say that most podcast episodes, I'm like staring at my computer the whole time and a whole bunch of notes, so this is a life change for me. Anyway, Alex, hi. 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 Uh, You fight with anyone on the internet recently? Um, I've been kind of busy with the jamboree, so I have not been in the comments section lately. <laughs> anyone out there fight with anyone on the internet today? Holler if you have. Um, I guess, wow, no one fought with anyone on the internet today. What a special day for all of us. Well, Alex, 
I don't know about you, but I really thought we did it. We're done. We're going to put this mission accomplished, right? Like we did it. We're never going to have to talk about this again. Maybe, maybe we can solve some of the world's other bigger problems. And then what do you know? I mean, actually, one time I did a post. We only did it one time, guys. I'm a kind of a coward. I did a post on TikTok about the ethics of reselling where people accused me of being a reseller and then therefore a landlord and all these other things. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm never going to talk about this on TikTok again. Uh, you see any of that going on anywhere still? Yeah, unfortunately, the same stuff that we talked about a year ago is still out yeah. there. Um, so why don't you get us started in talking about just like a little bit about your business and what you do for everyone who doesn't know you. Um, so hello again, I'm Alex. Um, I'm based in New York City. I own a vintage clothing brand called St. Evans. Um, I sell in person. I do a lot of pop-ups and markets in New York. I uh, stock at a brick and mortar and then I also sell online. Um, I joined the vintage community professionally in early 2020. It was February 2020, crazy time. And um, yeah, I had been selling very casually before that for several years, um, but officially launched like as a brand almost five years ago. Wow, that, that time went really, really fast. You know, something I feel really heavily when it comes to resellers, as, as a non-reseller myself, is that it seems like there's such a stigma around, I mean, just saying this out loud, how nonsense is this? There's a stigma around selling secondhand clothing, of all things, right? Do you ever feel pressured to keep any of your success kind of like a secret so people, so people aren't mad at you? It's really interesting because I feel like when you're talking about secondhand online, about vintage, about resale, if you share too much information, you risk alienating your fellow dealers and your community because there's you know this idea of gatekeeping, that there are certain things that are valuable that you're not supposed to be sharing with the public, you're revealing too much. Um, and then on the opposite end, if you don't talk about it and you aren't talking about what's going on behind the scenes, then you're accused of gatekeeping in the opposite direction. And you're then like keeping secrets and you're hoarding wealth and information that everyone <laughs> is supposed to be able to have access to for whatever reason. So no matter which way you approach it, you really can't win. Someone's always going to be mad at you. Yeah, I, I hear that. I mean, we talked about this back in our original series of episodes, and I really do believe that a big part of that is misogyny because the bulk of resellers are women, right? And whenever I see male resellers, you know, I, I know that Christine likes to call them t-shirt bros. <laughs> I look at their comments section and they're like, yo, you're the goat, you rule, you're, I'm going to be you when I grow up and stuff like that. And then I scroll the next thing, it's like a, a woman reseller and someone's like, you're the worst thing that's happened to this world. I wish you nothing but despair and ingrown toenails and whatever else bad can come your way, right? Like it's so obvious. Um, have you heard any new myths or resell like myths about resellers lately? You know, I actually, I was thinking about this before and I haven't heard anything new because I don't <laughs> think there's any new <laughs> myths to make. Again, we debunked everything that I see commonly online and I feel like there aren't any new myths because it's kind of hard to come up with good reasons that people shouldn't be shopping secondhand. There's only a few out there and people are just recycling the same ones still. No, I totally agree. Like these people are not original. <laughs> like... There's this person who shows up on some of my videos on YouTube to just be like, you know, resellers are landlords over and over again. I'm like, come on, that's the best you can come up with. I've been hearing that for years, right? Um, well, do, I mean, do you, what do you feel is the primary source or reason for all of this misinformation and just vitriol? I mean, this is something that we touched on when we recorded before, but I feel like so much of it is just personal feelings. It's very mm -hmm. emotional. Yeah. Um, you know, we look at the state of the world right now and there's a lot to feel really hopeless and really upset about. And a lot of people are really frustrated with their clothing options. They're mm -hmm. really bummed out by what's available in the stores. And a lot of that is also thrift stores. People go in and they see like 
the Shein, they see the quality of the clothing getting worse and worse in every store, which then trickles down to the thrift store. And you want someone to blame. You know, you go in, you see a bunch of garbage, you leave with nothing, you feel really defeated. And it's a lot easier to go after an individual than it is to yell into the void of goodwill or whatever corporation you want to be upset with. Mm -hmm. So it's just the easiest thing, I think, to like go into the comment section and vent your anger (laughs) at an individual person. And I guess people think it makes them feel better. But as we discussed before, in the long run, it's not good for anyone. It's not good for anyone. I mean, do you personally feel that there's nothing good left in the thrift stores? So I, um, because I live in New York city, I don't really get to thrift very often. I love thrifting. I get a lot of joy out of it, but it's just not something that I have access to. Um, I don't have a car thrifting in New York. Isn't great. So because I got to come out to beautiful Lancaster for the weekend, (laughs) I rented a car and took the opportunity to thrift along my way here. And man, there was so much good stuff in the thrift stores. I found really great stuff. I found great vintage. I found like really good contemporary stuff. Um, I found stuff for myself, my husband, my best friend. And yeah, it it was interesting because someone told me that the resellers took all the good stuff, but I don't know. I got some good stuff in my car. You think they returned it? Is that what happened? Gosh, those resellers, they're so wily, right? What will they do next? So, well, that is interesting. Like here you are, you run a business where you are reselling vintage clothing and you said you don't go thrifting very often. So where do you source stuff? So this is funny because I feel like it's, the better question is where don't I source stuff? (laughs) Right. Um, As anyone who is a vintage dealer knows, this really takes over your life. And then I feel like you also become known within your community and within your circle as like the girl who loves old stuff. And so (laughs) when people, you know, need to rehome things or they have a friend of a friend or a relative, you know, you're often the person they go to. Um, Or I've had people send me online listings for things. So I get every places like... I go to estate sales, I do online auctions, I have private clients that I purchase from. Um, Wherever I can find it, honestly, is where I get it. And most of the time, it's not from the thrift store. Yeah. I mean, I do think that one of the biggest sources for this anti-reseller sentiment is the the emotional nature of thrifting itself. Because all of this argument, we're going to be talking about thrifting a lot tonight, like thrift stores specifically, but anyone who's really in the secondhand game knows that that's just one place where you find secondhand clothing. But I really do believe, and I talked about this at the Jamboree yesterday, that a lot of this frustration comes from people who And I I think fast fashion has kind of created this illusion that everywhere you go, there should be infinite options to fill your cart very easily. Anyone who's a lifelong thrifter knows that sometimes it just is not a good thrift day, right? It's luck of the draw. It's what got donated that week, who shopped there that week. And it has nothing to do with resellers at all. But I think people are so used to just being able to have anything they want on demand at any given moment. And with Shein or Timu or Amazon or content on social media or any of the number of apps where we stream information and entertainment, we're accustomed to that. But a thrift store is never going to have everything on demand. And I think everybody needs to be okay with that. Once again, all of us who are regular thrifters know that. But if you don't know that, then you want to scapegoat someone because you're disappointed. And I just think that's a really big part of it. So uh, to, in preparation for tonight's episode, by the way, I'm just going to start throwing cards on the floor because they're a real burden. Um, I asked some people in our community to give me their experiences as resellers, as secondhand shoppers, et cetera. I'm going to be sharing some of these periodically through, as we're talking tonight. And this message comes from Maddie and Christy. They own a shop called Slowpoke Exchange in Bar, Vermont. And I, in their, I'm not going to read their whole email, but one thing they talked about was like, they are the only store within an hour drive of where they live that isn't like a Walmart, basically. And so they have a very a very excited community that is really stoked to have this other place to shop. And I asked them, like, where do you source? And they said, you know, different places at different times of our business. I don't know if you're familiar with Vermont, but community is strong here. Even more queer community is very tight. 
Then you combine queers wanting to support queers to open up a much needed business that also subverts fast fashion. That's a cocktail for excitement in this neck of the woods. So we joined forces with a local queer bar and did some inventory requests asking folks to drop off bags of unwanted but still in good shape clothing. We paid them $5 a trash bag, sight unseen. People were so happy to get us off the ground and donated some really nice items. We also get a lot of fair, a fair amount of garbage, but whatever. And I think that's what's really important is that at their shop, people are bringing in stuff regularly for sort of like buy, sell, trade, and donate. And because the community is so supportive of this business, they were telling me they've never once experienced anti-reseller sentiment because their community really understands the value of their work. I really, I just loved that. I was like, we need more of that, right? Right? One of the things I hear a lot, and I know you see this too, because people have no shame on the internet, I don't know if you've heard yet, is uh, resellers are jacking up the prices so they can get rich and run off with my money. So first things first, are you rich? I wish. Okay, did you like come here on a private jet or anything? No, I'm okay. driving like a clown car that I rented <laughs> Literally, for the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I think is the problem here is that People don't know, I mean, one, we, we know, people don't understand the value of clothing anymore. It's so warped, right? We think that, like, a dress should be $5, brand new, so that means if it's a secondhand, it should be approximately negative 50 cents, right? And we already have this, like, messed up concept of pricing. You know, this is something that only dads say, so if any of you out there have a dad, you're going to recognize this, but it's like... Once you drive a car off the lot, there goes the value, right? <laughs> That's, I feel like the moment you unzip a new article of clothing, it's worth negative 50 cents. And so I think that's part of it, right? We have this skewed sense of value, but I also think that people do not understand how much work goes into s selling secondhand clothing. I mean, that's why ThreadUp is lost $72 million last year. Could you just like briefly kind of walk us through the work you do to get one product available for sale? Yeah, I think one of the reasons that I actually hate the term reseller so much is because it's just like the tiniest sliver of the pie. Like, yes, I do resell. That is part of my job. But the sales is like kind of the beginning and the end. And there's mm -hmm. just so much in between. <laughs> yeah. I mean... The, I feel like one of the biggest differences actually between like a traditional thrift and a curated vintage store or boutique is the processing. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the biggest like parts of the job, one of the biggest parts of the labor. Um, so when I find inventory, um, I am washing everything and that means a lot of different things. Certain things are dry clean only. A lot of things need to be hand washed. Um, then there's like mending and repairs, which again, some of that I can do myself. Some of that needs to be sent mm -hmm. out to a professional to take care of, which again, then costs me money. Um, then there's research, finding out a, what the garment is, what era it's from. A lot of that is stuff that I know without having to do research, but that isn't something that like came to me overnight. Again, that mm -hmm. required a lot of labor, a lot of research, a lot of like intensive time, put in in the past that I'm now able to recoup later. Um, and then after that, uh, figuring out like what the market value is for something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, as much as people want to accuse resellers of scamming or ripping people off, the internet is available to everyone. We all have access <laughs> have to the heard? same search engines. Mm -hmm. So if you are a seller that's marking things at wildly inflated prices, people aren't going to pay those prices. Like, sure, you exactly. may you may occasionally find someone at a market that doesn't know and buys something on the fly. But for the most part, like people are price checking. I watch people mm -hmm. do it in person. Um, the brick and mortar store that I stock in, I work in there a couple times a month and I watch people Google lens items in the store in front of me. Like they don't care. They're not embarrassed. <laughs> but again, you do have to price within some sort of fair range because people do realize if you're not doing so. So again, doing that research of what's the going rate, what's the true value of this item, and then factoring that against the, your own costs. How much did I spend? how much time and labor is accounted for within that price and kind of trying to find something that works to balance those two numbers. It's, it's really tricky. And that honestly is like one of the very time consuming parts of that. 
Um, and then once you do figure out the price, you put it into a spreadsheet, um, you know, you organize it, you have to tag it, and then you're steaming it, you're prepping it. If you're taking it somewhere in person, there's like transportation and travel. If you're selling it online, you now have to take photographs, you have to take measurements. Um, even if you are selling in person, I usually tag all of my garments with sizes as well. So there's still measurements going on there, you know, maybe not exact the way they would be online, but I am still trying to get like a rough number so I can give people an idea of about what size it is. Um, yeah. And then if you are online, then the listing, that's like a whole other process. You're posting everything, um, you're putting it all up, you're, there's all kinds of different fiddly things no matter what website you're on. And then the last step of that is the promotion, the advertising, content, which we all know now is very much a full-time job. Um, if you want your stuff to sell, if you want to get in front of people, you got to make the reels, you got to model mm -hmm, it, you got to mm -hmm. get people to model it for you. It's, yeah, there are so many layers besides just the resale. Yeah, no, it's so much work. And to circle back to this idea that resellers are inflating prices, like, guys, I've been a buyer for how long now? And I will tell you, people just won't buy stuff that's overpriced, right? Like, I feel like a lot of people show up in comment sections on Clothes Horse to be like, yeah, well, they're jacking up the prices and it's not fair. And I'm like, guess what? They're either going to lower the prices or they're going to go out of business. It will fix itself. I'm not concerned. But I will tell you, I rarely see someone who I think is overcharging. And what I really see are people who are undercharging intentionally, which brings it down for everyone else, right? Yeah, I think something I also notice is that oftentimes when I hear people remark about the prices and they're like, whoa, why is this $200? I immediately clock that as you don't know what you're looking at. <laughs> Not to be super judgmental, <laughs> but right, with right. vintage, you know, there is very specific reasons that certain things are valuable. Things are rare. Things are hard to find. Mm -hmm. They can be very hard to find in certain condition, in a certain size, in a certain color or fabric. And so oftentimes when people are looking at an item and feeling like they don't like the price, it's because they don't have a real true understanding of why it's that price. And I think for a lot of people, if they did have more information and more access to information about why it was priced that way, they would maybe feel a little less aggressively shocked by some of those numbers. For sure. Um, so we're not going to really be busting the myths one by one tonight, but can we just take a classic that we never really dissected and just give it a minute? Are resellers landlords... <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay. So the way I see it here is like, for one, you tell me if I'm wrong here, cause I'm not a reseller. Are resellers buying the clothes, then having people pay monthly rent for them to use them. And then at the end, taking them back at will or jacking up the price to wear them, you know, yearly or more, I don't know, more regularly than that. And then periodically just saying, actually, I know that we had an agreement that you were going to wear those clothes for a year and pay me every month, but I'm actually taking them back now because I'm going to turn them into a condo. Wait, did, do you ever hear about that happening? Hmm, I don't think so. Right. The other thing I will just say is that when we really think about, this was like a shower moment for me. I was in the shower and it occurred to me, I was like, the real landlords of secondhand, well, they exist for sure. Their names are... Poshmark, Depop, Mercari, Vinted, eBay, Etsy, PayPal, Venmo, pirate ship maybe even, right? Why can't we just ask them to make it a better situation instead of ganging up on individuals? Also, that comparison particularly irks me because housing is a human right. Every <laughs> single person right. deserves access yes. to a house and a shelter. Clothing isn't like not a lot of the secondhand clothing that people are having these specific conversations about. Like, should everyone have a nice pair of pants, a warm coat, shoes on their feet? Absolutely, 100%. But all of this discourse is happening on TikTok videos of like Y2K dresses. <laughs> That's not a human right. No like, one needs no one, it, yeah. You just don't. And yeah. like most of the things that resellers are purchasing, especially vintage sellers, no one needs that no stuff. One needs like, it, yeah. Nobody deserves a 70s dress. It, that's just, it's not. It's a luxury. Right, right. If you can have that, if you can afford it and you have access to it, it's amazing. It's super exciting. Obviously, it's something I'm really passionate about, but it's not a human right. 
Well, the other thing, and I, I know I'm going to blow, blow some minds here. Are you all ready for this? Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever bought food, right? Okay. Okay. Good. 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 <laughs> um, anyone here ever bought like, I don't know, a phone, right? Okay. Anyone here ever bought anything ever? Raise your hand. All right. I'm about to tell you something that was mansplained to me once about 10 years into my career as a buyer. Did you know that when you go buy something from just about anywhere, it's actually being resold from somewhere else? Have, can you believe that? Yeah. The grocery store didn't create that food. They bought it from someone else. They're reselling it to you. And so what secondhand resellers are doing is no different than anyone else. And at least they're not trying to fleece you like grocery stores are right now. Yeah. Right? That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, let's go out in the audience and take some questions. If you have a question or comment, uh, raise your hand and I'll come to you. Um, if your question or comment is really good, I'm going to give you a sticker. But to be honest, even if it's bad, I will. Okay. Um, tell us your name, uh, where you live, and what your question is. My name is Jasmine. I live here in Lancaster. So got to get a coffee with you. But I'm wondering how long it took for your, let's say your branded vintage business to become sus financially sustainable and or profitable. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, you get a sticker. Okay. <laughs> So I do not sell vintage full time. Mm -hmm. um, I live in New York City and the reality of that is that it is very expensive. Um, I have been in hospitality and retail for a very long time. I've been bartending for almost 14 years and I'm still at it. Um, I do vintage full time in the sense that I put in full time number of hours, but <laughs> I also work a part time job on top of it um, because it does not pay my bills. Yeah. I mean, I would love to see a show of hands. Is anyone in here a full-time reseller and well, and you live off of it. You don't have another job. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's what I figured. I mean, that's all the resellers I know for sure. Um, does anybody else have a question, a comment? Anyone want to fight with me about resellers being landlords? Okay. I'm going to cut across you here. I already know you, but can you introduce yourself to everyone anyway? Hi, my name's Ruby and I live in Philly. And my question is, what advice would you have for somebody who's thinking about entering the reseller space, like either, either as like a part-time thing or like in, yeah, like in addition to a full-time job or. So something that I was talking to Christine about earlier, it's a pivot that I've made within the last like probably two years is I've actually moved away from using the word reseller to describe myself to other people. Um, so, you know, people are frequently asking me, oh, what do you do for work? I either say that I'm a vintage dealer or that I own a vintage brand. <laughs> and it's interesting because it's not necessarily the easiest or most convenient answer. People often then have a lot of questions. They like don't necessarily understand what that is. But I do feel like associating yourself with the word resale is triggering for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And it's just that term because, again, people don't necessarily understand or they, they don't think more deeply about what that means. And so they just hear resale. And then again, we get back into this vicious circle of resellers are doing this, resellers are doing that. <laughs> so I purposely stepped away from that word. And that's something I would really recommend for other vintage dealers, whether or not they're new or have been in the game for a long time. Um, another thing that I think is really helpful is I know for a lot of people starting out, especially for sellers that are sourcing a large part of their inventory at thrift stores, it's very tempting to use the word thrift in association with your mm -hmm. brand or with like markets and events that you're throwing. And I would really like to see the vintage community move away from that. Uh, the vintage and the maker community, I think that using the word thrift, again, immediately triggers an association with shoppers and with customers. And I think that it's a way that vintage sellers are devaluing their work and their mm -hmm. labor and the value of the clothing that they're selling. Yes. Before people even get to see it, people hear thrift and they're immediately like, they just have so many thoughts. There's so much baggage there. And I feel like you can just take that step away and remove yourself from that. So yeah, I really, I see a lot of sellers, especially newer sellers that brand themselves as blank thrift or blank thrifted as part of their name. And a lot of small markets are the same. They're blank thrift market 
And I just think that that would be like a really, that would be big advice for me for people starting out to try and avoid using that as part of your branding. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that we, in a weird way, not even a weird way, just a straightforward way, we actually need to remove the word thrift from secondhand. I tend to use them interchangeably because I'm trying to like connect with people when we talk about it. But ultimately you say the word thrift to someone and they think it should be free basically. Right. Um, and that's just, there's so much curation and work involved in selling secondhand, particularly vintage, but really all of it that I do wonder if we're devaluing clothing by referring to a thrifting or anything secondhand. Right. Does anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Well, I already know your name too, but you can tell us anyway. I'm Corey. I also live in Lancaster. Um, my question comes from a place where I've had personal experience mending clothes for people who have thrifts or reselling stores and feeling like I have to undercharge for them to get a good deal so they they can upcharge for their for their garments. Like how do you find a happy middle ground when you work with people who are repairing your clothes? That's a, a really, good one. Yeah, that's yeah. a really tough you question because I feel like so many dealers are also undercharging themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's so hard to have that conversation with someone who's not paying themselves enough that you then need to be paid fairly. I feel like it, my advice probably would be just to seek out the people that do understand the true value of their work and therefore understand the true value of your work. Because I do know plenty of dealers out there that pay like very fair wages to the people that they work with. Um, I think it's just a matter of finding the right people and not saying yes to the people who don't want to pay you fairly. Yeah, I agree with that. Like ultimately, and this is the advice I give to all of my clients and people I teach business stuff is when we lift ourselves up from a pricing perspective and really give ourselves the true value of our work, we lift up everyone around us, everyone who's helping us and everybody else who is selling or doing whatever we do alongside us. And I think particularly in the world of secondhand, but also with makers, we tend to undersell ourselves. I think it's, it's a push pull of both everything on Shein is approximately 50 cents. And also that we, we have imposter syndrome, right? We're like, how could someone ever possibly pay me what I'm really worth? And when we're underselling ourselves, everybody else around us is pressured to undersell themselves as well. And I do think it, it feels unfair sometimes that there's so much pressure for us as individuals to do the work of educating other people while we're also trying to make a living. But unfortunately, right now, we have to educate the people around us, which you do a lot of. By the way, uh, Alex has an amazing sub stack, 1-800 Vintage, one of my favorites. You should check it out. Let's take a moment to thank some of the incredible small businesses who keep Clothes Horse going via their generous Patreon support. Selena Sanders, a social impact brand that specializes in upcycle clothing using only reclaimed vintage or thrifted materials from tea towels, linens, blankets, and quilts. Sustainably crafted in Los Angeles, each piece is designed to last in one's closet for generations to come. Maximum style, minimal carbon footprint. Shift clothing out of beautiful Astoria, Oregon, with a focus on natural fibers, simple hardworking designs, and putting fat people first. Discover more at shiftwheeler.com. Late to the party, creating one-of-a-kind statement clothing from vintage, salvaged, and thrifted textiles. They hope to tap into the dreamy memories we all hold. Floral curtains, a childhood dress, the wallpaper in your best friend's rec room all while creating modern, sustainable garments that you'll love wearing and have for years to come. Late to the Party is passionate about celebrating and preserving textiles, the memories they hold, and the stories they have yet to tell. Check them out on Instagram at Late to the Party People. Vino Vintage, based just outside of LA. We love the hunt of shopping secondhand because you never know what you might find. Catch us at flea markets around Southern California by following us on Instagram at vino.vintage so you don't miss our next event. Dylan Page is an online clothing and lifestyle brand based out of St. Louis, Missouri. 
Our products are chosen with intention for the conscious community. Everything we carry is animal-friendly, ethically made, sustainably sourced, and cruelty-free. Dylan Page is for those who never stop questioning where something comes from. We know that personal experience dictates what's sustainable for you, and we are here to help guide and support you to make choices that fit your needs. Check us out at dylanpage.com and find us on Instagram at Dylan Page Life and Style. Salt Hats, purveyors of truly sustainable hats, hand blocked, sewn, and embellished in Detroit, Michigan. Find us on Instagram at Salt Hats. Gentle Vibes Vintage. We are purveyors of polyester and psychedelic relics. We encourage experimentation and play not only in your wardrobe, but in your home too. We have thousands of killer vintage pieces ready for their next adventure. See them all on Instagram at Gentle Vibes Vintage. Thumbprint is Detroit's only fair trade marketplace located in the historic Eastern Market. Our small business specializes in products handmade by empowered women in South Africa, making a living wage, creating things they love like hand-painted candles and ceramics. We also carry a curated assortment of sustainable and natural locally made goods. Thumbprint is a great gift destination for both the special people in your life and for yourself. Browse our online store at thumbprintdetroit.com and find us on Instagram at thumbprintdetroit. Vagabond Vintage DTLV is a vintage clothing, accessories, and decor reselling business based in downtown Las Vegas, Nevada. Not only do we sell in Las Vegas, but we're also located throughout resale markets in San Francisco, as well as at a curated boutique called Lux and Ivy located in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jessica, the founder and owner of Vagabond Vintage DTLV, recently opened the first IRL location located in the Arts District of downtown Las Vegas on August 5th. The shop has a strong emphasis on 60s and 70s garments, single stitch tees, and dreamy loungewear. Follow them on Instagram at Vagabond Vintage DTLV and keep an eye out for their website coming fall of 2022. Okay, well, let's bring up our next guest, who also has a lot of thoughts about this, likes to fight with people on the internet. Uh, let's bring up Christine from Lady Hog Vintage. Come on up. All right, Christine, uh, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Oh, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name's Christine Hogg, and I started Lady Hog Vintage. Um, it was kind of a moniker that was taken from schoolyard taunts, um, with the last name hog, you can imagine. Yeah, um, right. so it was kind of a take on Miss Piggy. I, mean, I think hog. that's a compliment. Yeah. What do you guys think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Total icon. Um, I started selling, I mean, like high school and college, um, I would take stuff to buy, sell trade stores and then, um, especially in college, I really started relying on that. And I would even go behind thrift stores where they would throw things away mm -hmm. and dumpster dive. But I would have to work really hard for the to clean up the items because they were discarded by Goodwill um, and other thrift stores. And then um, I really started going more ham on it in... 2009 when Etsy opened to vintage mm -hmm. um, and so selling online became a big thing for me and that was during the Mad Men era so there was mm -hmm. a lot of popularity within true vintage dresses and it was amazing to see what those could sell for because they were in such demand at the time the main key search term was unique vintage dress what a time to be alive. <laughs> well, yeah. um, and then from there, I just um, kept plugging away and I got a job at a vintage store in Portland in 2009 and really took flight from there and just made it my whole life, you know, because it was I graduated college into the gig economy mm -hmm. and it was a way for me to find a place for myself with like a neuro spicy mind outside of a corporate workplace. 
So you've been doing this for a long time. I actually, whenever I'm talking to new resellers, I bring you up and like your success and the hustle that you've put into it. Do you feel like anti-reseller sentiment was, has always been around or do you feel that it has gotten worse recently? I mean, um, I think when I started, there was maybe a whisper of it. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's been going on for some time, but it's definitely ramped up, I think, with um, how ubiquitous uh, online discourse is, mm-hmm. with Instagram, TikTok, like the right. fighting I've seen. Even since your episode, there was a, a so weird boring. incident in Portland where a girl had something stolen from her in a market. And then she was at another market and the girl was wearing the pants and came into (gasps) her booth. And so she took photos of her and posted them online, trying to shame the girl. And it backfired. It was wild. It was just, I mean, you know, I don't know that that would happen to a man. I don't think it, I don't think it would. I, I, I think, I mean, I literally saw someone say on TikTok that resellers are subhuman. Can we talk about that for a moment? Because that kind of language, it is drama, Dylan, you're right. But it also, when we dehumanize people, no matter what the group of people is, what we're doing is we're setting them up to be victims of violence and crime. And I worry about this going off the rails. Now, I don't know if either of you remember this, but back when the original series of episodes about resellers came out, I did a post, it was like, you know, it was a month long series of posts. And I did, the final post was like, what is the impact of anti-reseller rhetoric and where does it come from? And someone who I don't know on the internet, but I certainly do now, I thought that I made that post about them. Yeah. And so that person, I remember it so clearly. Dustin and I were sitting next to each other on the couch in Austin, Texas, and I was losing my shit, to be honest, because this person was like, Close Horse Podcast is silencing freedom of speech by making a post about me and not letting me comment on it. Well, first thing, fun fact, you got to follow Close Horse to comment because it keeps out people like that, right? But I'm not silencing anyone. And so then what they proceeded to do was do post after post after post for about 12 hours about comparing me to Nazis. Remember this? Talking about how my podcast is stupid and I'm ugly and I don't know what I'm talking about and just going on and on and on. They, they got blocked, but people kept sending me posts and then their friends would show up and try to confront me in the comments until they got blocked. And then they started their own podcast about how resellers are monsters. I know. God, this is hilarious, right? Um, she did drink all the haterade. Yeah. I, the good news is like, I think they only put out 12 episodes and it, it, it flopped. <laughs> so it's impressive, right? Like, cause I'm a, I'm really bad at holding a grudge, but I do have a lot of complicated revenge fantasies and I've never once been like, you know what I'm going to do is start a revenge podcast. So kudos to them. But I mean, this is how bad it caught. And I'm going to tell you, I was afraid right? I was afraid. I was like, this is vegan leather part two. People are going to send me death threats and look up my phone number on the internet and harass me. Fortunately, it died because most people realize that like, you know, this post wasn't about this person. Um, but that was scary, right? And I see this kind of stuff happening and it doesn't surprise me that someone would steal a pair of pants from someone and people would side with the person who stole the pants. They probably, at least one person said, well, she's just a landlord, Right? Right. Yeah. So I, I do think it has, it has escalated. And I think a lot of these myths, which we've talked about before are opinions that were repeated so many times that they are, they come facts to people, right? We know that they're not facts and they're frankly boring. And I would really like to see them come up with some new ones because I'm tired of talking about the same ones. So maybe someone will listen to this, like hate, listen to it and they'll come up with a new one for us to talk about. That'll be great. Four more episodes of it. What do you think? Um, Okay, so Christine, I wanted to ask you, like, where do you source your product? Like Alex said, like the common refrain that we all give out is everywhere. (laughs) Um, But I would say, especially since 2020, I've really even laid off Goodwill, any thrift stores, the bins, 
I just, it, even estate sales stress me out now. Yeah, agreed. Um, and so I've leaned a lot more into private buys. Um, you know, like Alex said, I think once you've been selling vintage for long enough, people come to you and they say, oh, you know, my dad died. I need help cleaning out the house. Um, or, you know, you just, you, you find more opportunities to buy directly from clients. Um, and then I actually love an antique store. I know that seems a Same. little off the yeah. thought process for buying to resell, but um, you know, it's a, it's a great place for finding, um, a lot of different vendors within one store and different price points. Um, but usually also that is a higher price point that I'm paying and it's mostly just going to one or two specific clients that I know are going to buy those items. It's very, it's a little more niche, but, um, and then I would also say buy, sell trade stores. Mm, it's true. It's a Vintage, great way to so take stale items that maybe I'm struggling to uh, reallocate within my clients um, and then take that and then buy fresh inventory. And it keeps that cycle going and then also keeps fresh things for other people. And it's a great community way to keep that circle churning. Yeah, I think that's that's great. So have either of you noticed that prices are higher? for secondhand clothing and secondhand stuff. Literally everywhere. Like, everywhere. I mean, grocery yeah. stores, et cetera. Like, that's our new economy. Yeah. I mean, something we've talked about before is that the prices for everything have gone up except for how much people are being paid. And Fun. The cost of, <laughs> and the cost of clothes. Clothes yeah. have gotten cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, fast could also be applied to other consumer goods like home goods, decor. A lot of that has also gotten cheaper. So anything that can kind of be sold within the fast fashion model has gone down in price while literally everything else in our lives, housing, cars, food, going to bars and restaurants, going to, I mean, like, have you tried to buy a concert ticket lately? Absolutely oh, insane. It's so expensive. Yeah. yeah. And so it's interesting that like everything has gone up and yet specifically people are very, very focused on secondhand because a, I would even argue that it wouldn't be going up at the same trajectory as a lot of other things have been. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it is, I, I noticed the pricing as well in thrift stores and I know that it has nothing to do with resellers or the popularity of thrifting really. Um, it's, it's weird to me that people will glom on to thrift stores being more expensive when everything else around us is so much more expensive. It's interesting, right? But it's like, I think it's like something we feel like we can control. But the prices definitely have gone up. Yeah, the thrift store sure. prices have absolutely gone up. Yeah, for sure. It's also wild that they've been going up. And like at first I was like, oh, well, they're paying employees more. But actually <laughs> a lot of thrift stores are starting to take away employees and put in self-checkout. Yes. Which is also bonkers because how are they monitoring theft with less employees? As people that have worked in retail, I'm sure that is also pretty mind-boggling. Yeah, yeah, holler if you worked in retail. Oh, well, well, right. Yeah. Um, I agree. I mean, we talked about this yesterday at the Jamboree that really, I think like these businesses are being very short sighted where they're like, I'd rather not pay people and then have everything be stolen. And now they're realizing, oh, that was a bad idea. Feel sorry for us, which we don't. Right. So listen, we already learned that Alex is not getting rich off of this. Sorry, Alex, but you must be Christine, right? You've been doing it for a long time. Are you rich? Man, I'm Scrooge McDuckin. No, just kidding. Just kidding. That's the corporate landlords, the corporate, the corporate CEOs. Yeah. Well, that's a great segue. Cause can I just tell you a little bit about who, cause you know, guess what? People are getting rich off of secondhand. Do you want to hear that who they are? I got to look at my cards here. There's a lot of numbers here. Okay, so first off, we've got Poshmark. Poshmark's 2023 revenue was $262 million. $262 million. And guess what? They didn't sell one thing. That's fees from sellers, right? Once again, didn't sell a single thing. Record revenue number for them. Depop, 2023, $63 million dollars. Also a record. Once again, did Depop sell anything? No. Uh, Mercari. Now, this is a big number. Hold on to your hats. 
$1.3 billion. That's with a B, also a record. eBay makes Mercari look like amateur hour with $10 billion in revenue. Once again, does eBay sell anything? Hell no. No, no, right? Um, None of these platforms made anything. They just served as a place where people could buy stuff. This is who's getting rich from the world of secondhand. Um, who else makes money off of secondhand? We got PayPal, Venmo, all the, uh, what I call the app industrial complex, the things you need to pay for to run your business. Am I missing anyone here that you is taking your money? Square, Shopify, yeah. yes, Etsy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the shipping platforms, you know, it's... Yeah, Mm -hmm. Amazon, for sure. Yeah. Um, I personally do not feel, just based on what I know, that the current secondhand economy is equitable for resellers at all, right? And we've already seen that these large businesses like ThreadUp, they can't actually make money off of this. So ultimately, for secondhand to continue and to become second nature for everyone, it's going to have to be done peer to peer by individuals like on Poshmark, like on Depop, et cetera. Do you have any thoughts on how that's more equitable, equitable for resellers? Because I feel like right now it can't continue the way it is. I feel like my answer to that is something a lot of people aren't going to like, but I think a lot of resellers need to raise their prices. And I think that there needs to be a larger conversation with consumers about why the prices are what they are. And I think people need to adjust their mindset about what they're willing to pay for and why, which again circles back to the devaluing of clothing because of fast fashion. People think that it's okay or appropriate or that clothing should be very, very inexpensive and like nothing, there's no clothes that should cost under a certain amount. Like $5 clothing just isn't, it shouldn't be a thing if, you know, the amount of labor, even if it's secondhand, even if the garment's already been made, even the most minimal amount of processing of like taking it out of a bag, getting it on a hanger, sticking a price tag on it, someone's checking you out, someone's giving you a plastic bag to leave, that just doesn't cover that cost. And I feel like that conversation really needs to happen. I do. And I also think like that is one of the reasons we're seeing thrift store prices be higher. Here are companies who get their inventory for free and yet they can't make the math math after they pay people to sort it, hang it, tag it, ring it up, run the store, pay the rent, send away all the trash, et cetera, et cetera. Even thrift store prices shouldn't be as low as they are in many regards, but we expect stuff to be super cheap because we have no value for it, right? So Christine, you know, like, well, like I said earlier, you've been doing this for a really long time. Do you feel that it's easier, it's been easier for you to make a living since secondhand became more popular and mainstream? Um, I would say, especially since the pandemic, I've actually struggled more with within my own sphere with health. I shattered my wrist and that has taken a lot away from my productivity. Um, but always like with the gig economy mindset, it's how do I pivot Um, so I've had to pivot into teaching classes, selling at more spaces in town, doing more market. Well, the markets I've had to lay back on because of the physical problems that I've had, but, um, it's, it's definitely been a challenge and that pivot has made me work more hours in stores and take on more mending commissions and just figure out how to make it work for myself, Um, And it's been weird to see, you know, within that bubble, um, the pricing bubble, like a lot of people did go kind of hard with pricing. um, And now I'm starting to see that soften, much to the detriment of everybody, I guess. And I am seeing like maybe some thinning out of the people that have come in during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely seeing that too. I'm sure a lot of you in the audience know people who've stopped selling secondhand, right? So, you know, one of the myths that's out there that Alex and I debunked a couple years ago or a year ago, I like saying it's a couple years ago, it sounds even more important, um, was that, you know, a classic myth here that resellers 
are stealing clothes that are intended for poor people, right? And they're profiting from them. And ultimately, I mean, I get where that comes from because everything is more expensive. It's harder to find things. And it feel, I think many of us feel poor and probably are, right? How, how or is, is it even the responsibility of resellers to provide more access to low cost clothing to low income people or should that responsibility rest on someone else and who? I mean, a majority of resellers that I know would qualify as low income. Mm -hmm. I don't really know wealthy people that resell. Maybe there are some wealthy people that like do it very casually as a fun hobby, but there are so many people that rely on resale because they are unable to work traditional jobs. They have you know, physical disabilities, they have accessibility issues. There are so many different reasons that people rely on that. So it's interesting that people are so quick to defend this quote unquote poor people that need clothes, but then at the same time, the same people that they're supposedly defending that are relying on resale to then take care of themselves, they don't need protection in the comments for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah, good call, good call out, yeah. I also feel like thrift stores could, if they wanted to, have a charity arm, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I mean, and Goodwill pretends, you know, they'll round up your purchase to give it to disabled training. But what does that really mean? You know, and also what are they doing with their discarded clothes? I know actually there are some independent thrift stores that buy and resell rag trade. And so things that go unsold go back into that weird economy too, rather than to the hands of the people that maybe need the clothes yeah, more. Very true. Very true. And I've personally taken a, upon myself to try and give back as much as possible. And I'm not trying to get on a pedestal for that. And people have accused me of that. But, you know, if I'm at, you know, when I would go to the bins, if I'd find a lightweight sleeping bag, what is that to add to my cart to then hand out to somebody standing on the street corner? But that's not my job, you know, but it was part of, well, if I see it, why don't I try? But that isn't my responsibility. Like, but, and the reality is if you hadn't bought that sleeping bag, you'd probably go to the landfill. Exactly. I mean, or gone to a, sh a clothing shredder to be made into like, car seats. I don't, you know, like what, what are we doing with our rag trade? That's yeah, the other know, wild thing is like, that's its own economy that I've always been very curious of. And like, how does that global rag trade work? Well, very secretly. Yeah. And that yeah, was really yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. So let's take some more questions from the audience. I'm going to go over here and get the reward stickers. Go ahead and raise your hand. If you have a question or a comment, come on, don't be shy. Okay, Stacey, I know you have many opinions, so get on, stand on up here. Okay, introduce yourself, where you're from. I'm Stacey, I'm from Toledo, but I live in Athens, Ohio now. I've been a vintage dealer for 27 years and an avid thrifter for going on 30. I've heard, so thrift stores can and do give clothing to the poor. Um, I've heard one anecdote ever about Goodwill doing so. The Salvation Army in my town had kind of a program there was a little church thrift um, out on the edge of town that is everyone's secret favorite that has an active voucher program that they use. I saw a thrift store in Springfield do the same thing just last year. Some woman was in there with vouchers buying clothes for her children. Um, and I was in a Catholic store not too far from my, like two counties over, where they were giving two people who'd randomly come in off the street clothing, bedding, whatever they needed, just giving it to them. I don't think they even made them, there wasn't means testing. Like they didn't make them prove their income. They just gave it to them. There's so much, they could just all do that. But anyway, so it's insane to me that people get mad at us for taking quote unquote things that are quote unquote for the poor. Like it doesn't have to work that way. It doesn't work that way. Anyway, that's it. No, I think that's a good call out. Here's your sticker. Good job. Um, I will say, you know, when we were beginning our series on the myths of secondhand, uh, I wondered too, like our thrift stores for poor people. I was like, you know, I'm a, I'm a proud second, third generation poor person. And I've been thrifting a lot because often I couldn't afford to go anywhere else. And I did wonder, are thrift stores for poor people? And after a lot of research, it turns out, guess what? 
Thrift stores were never intended to get stuff in the hands of people who had little money. What they were intended to do was sell stuff to raise money for charitable actions, right? Like, so Goodwill's ostensible mission is providing job training, right? Others are, you know, maybe more religious focused and they're doing church things and out there preaching or whatever. Um, all of the amazing uh, Mennonite committee stores here, by the way, we're so lucky. Everyone who lives here in Lancaster can we really have the best thrifting. Those actually, that money is going into many programs, including uh, refugee resettlement, right? So that's the point of it. It's not to provide low cost goods for poor people. But I also didn't know that until I'd done a ton of reading. And actually, thrift stores forever have been really focusing on middle class customers because they need that money to keep their business rolling, to sell more stuff, to do the charitable thing that they want to do. And thrift stores have actually spent a lot of time and money over the past 50, 60 years trying to make thrifting more appealing to middle class people. That includes putting stores in locations that are convenient, right? That includes merchandising. That includes even, you know, signage you see around the a store that talks about the charitable give back and the environmental impact of shopping secondhand. You see it everywhere you go, right? It's all about selling more stuff to people to raise money for the charitable action. So I do, I know now that the stores are not there to give cheap stuff, but how do we get more people to understand that? Anyone? <laughs> I feel like a big thing too is that we often do this with so many other issues is that we focus so much on the solution instead of talking about the root of the actual mm -hmm. problem, like what's yep. causing this. And it's not okay that people don't have access to nice clothes. Like no, that's, a, yeah. that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. But instead of talking about who is responsible for helping them or like it, why are we not pivoting more to talking about why this, why is it like that in the first place? Like, why are there so many people that don't have access to these things? Why are there so many people that can't afford nice clothes? Yeah. That's the real issue here and mm -hmm. we should, you know, so much energy could be focused on discussing that instead. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, does anybody else have any questions, comments? All right, we're gonna come over here. Um, can you stand up please? It hurts my back, my feet really hurt guys. Okay, uh, tell us your name, where you live and your question. Hi all, I'm Jesse. I live in Brooklyn. Um, and I guess just I wanted to add on to your amazing comment that you gave and that there are these like big thrift stores like Salvation Army and Goodwill. And then there's like really community run ones in Brooklyn. We have like the big reuse that is all about environmentalism and keeping things out of the waste stream. And then like find your local, like if, if people are trying to like rehome things, like find your local mutual aid group. Like th those are the groups that are like really trying to get things into the hands of people who maybe don't have the resources or the funds to get them. And so, yeah, I just wanna like really agree that like thrift stores are not meant for people who don't have access to clothes. There's all these other groups that have literally no resources. They're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts and in solidarity with people. And so, yeah, just stop being rude to resellers. They're just trying to like live their lives. Seriously, can we get a round of applause for that? All right, I think I saw a hand over here. Yeah, here we go. All right, you wanna tell us your name, where you're from, and give us your question or comment. So I'm actually not gonna tell you my name and where I'm from um, because I had to sign an NDA to work in a rag house. Okay. Wow. <laughs> you, everybody, I just got chills. <laughs> okay, I can just get up there on the stage. And I just want to let you know, there's there's plenty of clothes. Like, nobody is taking all the clothes. The thrift store is selling them to rag houses. Yeah, a lot of it's crap. A lot of it's Shein. A lot of it's Shein that still has the tags on it. But a lot of it's, like, perfectly nice. A lot of it's 100% cotton or 100% wool. Resellers are not taking all the clothes. We're shipping it to other countries and making it their problem. So... Yep, yep. Um, by the way, can we just give a moment of applause for this anonymous whistleblower's outfit? Thank you. Amazing. It has horses on it. I don't know if you, this show is called Clothes Horse. That's amazing. Yeah. 
If you're enjoying this episode, then this is a great time to remind you that my work here at Close Horse is made possible by the support of listeners like you, just like NPR, and these great small businesses. Please go give them your support. Blank Cass or Blanket Coats by Cass, is focused on restoring, renewing, and reviving the history held within vintage and heirloom textiles by embodying the love, craft, and energy that is original to each vintage textile as I transfer it into a new garment. I hope we can reteach ourselves to care for and mend what we have and make it last. Blank Cass lives on Instagram at blank underscore Cass, and a website will be launched soon at blankcass.com. Located in Whistler, Canada, Velvet Underground is a velvet jungle full of vintage and secondhand clothing, plants, a vegan cafe, and lots of rad products from other small sustainable businesses. Our mission is to create a brand and community dedicated to promoting self-expression, as well as educating and inspiring a more sustainable and conscious lifestyle, both for the people and the planet. Find us on Instagram at shop underscore velvet underground or online at www.shopvelvetunderground.com. St. Evans is a New York City based vintage shop that is dedicated to bringing you those special pieces you'll reach for again and again. More than just a store, St. Evans is dedicated to sharing the stories and history behind the garments. 10% of all sales are donated to a different charitable organization each month. New Vintage is released every Thursday at wearstevens.com with previews of new pieces and more brought to you on Instagram at where underscore st dot evens. That's where St. Evans. Country Feedback is a mom and pop record shop in Tarboro, North Carolina. They specialize in used rock, country, and soul and offer affordable vintage clothing and housewares. Do you have used records you want to sell? Country Feedback wants to buy them. Find us on Instagram at Country Feedback Vintage and Vinyl or head down east and visit our brick and mortar. All are welcome at this inclusive and family-friendly record shop in the country. Republica Unicornia Yarns. Handmade yarn and notions for the color obsessed. Made with love and some swearing in fabulous Atlanta, Georgia by head yarn wench Kathleen. Get ready for rainbows with a side of giving a damn. Republica Unicornia is all about making your own magic using small batch, responsibly sourced, hand dyed yarns and thoughtfully made notions. Slow fashion all the way down and discover the joy of creating your very own beautiful hand knit, crocheted or woven pieces. Find us on Instagram at Republica underscore Unicornia underscore yarns and at www.republicaunicornia.com. Picnic Wear, a slow fashion brand ethically made by hand from vintage and dead stock materials, most notably vintage towels. Founder Danny has worked in the industry as a fashion designer for over 10 years, but started Picnic Wear in response to her dissatisfaction with the industry's shortcomings. Picnic Wear recently moved to rural North Carolina, where all their sewing and accessories are now designed and cut, but the majority of their sewing is done by skilled garment workers in New York City. Their customers take comfort in knowing that all their sewists are paid well above New York City minimum wage. Picnic Wear offers minimal waste and maximum authenticity. Future vintage over future garbage. Cute Little Ruin is an online shop dedicated to providing quality vintage and secondhand clothing, vinyl, and home items in a wide range of styles and price points. If it's ethical and legal, we try to find a home for it. Vintage style with progressive values. Find us on Instagram at Cute Little Ruin. Is there a little bit of Italy in your soul? Are you an enthusiast of pre-loved decor and accessories? Bring vintage Italian style and history into your space with the pewter thimble. We source useful and beautiful things and mend them where needed. We also find gorgeous illustrations and make them print worthy. Tarot cards, tea towels, and hand-picked treasures available to you from the comfort of your own home. Responsibly sourced from across Rome, lovingly renewed by fairly paid artists and artisans, with something for every budget. Discover more at thepewterthimble.com.
Com. Deco Denim is a startup based out of San Francisco, and it sells clothing and accessories that are sustainable, gender fluid, size inclusive, and high quality, made to last for years to come. Deco Denim is trying to change the way you think about buying clothes. Founder Sarah Mattis wants to empower people to ask important questions like, where was this made? Was this garment made ethically? Is this fabric made of plastic? Can this garment be upcycled? And if not, can it be recycled? Sign up at decodenim.com to receive $20 off your first purchase. They promise not to spam you and send out no more than three emails a month, with two of them surrounding education or a personal note from the founder. Again, that's decodenim.com. All right, um, we're gonna bring up another guest because we're talking about thrift stores a lot here. And I thought, why not go to the source? Why not get someone who's actually worked in a thrift store and isn't afraid to talk about it? So let's welcome to the stage, Dylan McCarty Skidmore. Hi. So Dylan, do, do you know me? I'm not really sure. <laughs> Are you? Kind of like a Nepo baby. Yeah, I'm like really rich and get a lot of opportunities. <laughs> yeah, I'm like really far so, in my life right now. So Dylan's my child, in case you were wondering. Um, and Dylan actually, sorry, I got to pick up my cards here. I'm just going to say this. I never was like, Dylan, it would be super sick if you went and worked undercover at the Goodwill um, so that we could talk about it on Close Horse. But then you did go work at Goodwill. Right? Can you tell us how long did you work there? Um, I did work there for under a year, so it's not like I worked there for extremely long time, but it was about a year. It was a little under, a, you know. And like, what was your experience like there? Good, bad? Um, so I'll get it all the way. The best part about it was definitely like overall, I had a really good set of coworkers. Like probably the best set of coworkers I've had at any job. Like it was just so much fun on that aspect, but there are a lot of parts about the job outside of that that were kind of awful. Um, I actually had just started out as a cashier when I first started working there before I started working in the back and I was only getting paid 975 and this was in 2020. Um, and this was like right when I moved out too. So like that was not very fun. <laughs> um, and even when I had started working in the back, I think the highest I was getting paid was 1150. Um, which is, you know, abysmal. But besides being a cashier, once I started working in the back, I had worked with pretty much everything from wear sorting, clothing sorting, hanging up clothing, putting out wares, pretty much everything. So your final job at, the, at Goodwill was sorting the donations that come in. So you know, first thing, we already talked about this because all of us are seeing the uh, thrift store inventory and offering from the front of house, right? We're customers. And, you know, I think we've agreed that there's still good stuff. Did you feel like good stuff was coming in? Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, there was a lot of stuff that I even, like, wanted to buy myself. I, It just is not true that there's no longer good stuff in the thrift store. And I also think that, you know, it's a matter of opinion because not everybody's looking for the same exact same thing. Can we get a round of applause for that? Yes. I mean, it's just, like, people seem to think that, you know, this, like, these unnamed poor people, everybody's looking for the Y2K coquette top at the thrift store. And it's just, like, not true. Like, I don't know what... It just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, yes, there is a lot of Shein and like other really poorly made fast fashion brands that come in. I mean, 100%. Um, and likely it is the majority from what I've seen, but there's still plenty of vintage that comes in. Um, also, the brands that they want us to send to Shop Goodwill or price up are not usually the vintage clothing. That's the thing. Like, they just want newer name brand stuff like Free People and Urban Outfitters and, like, other department store brands. Usually the vintage gets put out unless it's something that's extremely valuable. Yeah, um, I don't know if any of you here well, are trolls on Reddit like I am, which means I just creep on everybody, but there's this amazing subreddit called Thrift Grift. Stacy, you should check it out. You're going to love it. Um, and it's a mixture of people who are resellers, average, avid thrifters, and people who work in thrift stores. And I think it was maybe earlier this year, someone on there shared a list from their Goodwill in the Midwest, 
like that was in the back of the things that they must pull to send to shopgoodwill.com. And it was, just, I was like, who cares about these brands? But it was, it was free people and Lululemon and basically national brands. But then it was also wool, cotton, linen, you know, anything that is like natural fibers, leather, et cetera. And so it did make me wonder like what was left on the sales floor after that. So did you feel pressured to pull things to send to shop goodwill? Honestly, no. And I do think that it depends on like store to store because honestly, we weren't sending a lot of clothing to shop goodwill. I know obviously there are other stores that surely are, but at least at the location that I worked at, it was more based on wares. So anything that's not clothing, that was more so being sent there. When it came to clothing, I mean, we had such an excess of clothing donations. Um, they would usually have to order raw wares for us to go through. But when it came to clothing, we, we don't have to order clothing. Like raw, like, you know, like that kind of stuff. Because it gets donated so much. Like just such an excess of clothing. And the majority of it does not go out. And the majority of it is pulled from the sales floor before it's even bought. So what would be the determining factor for an article of clothing going on the sales floor or not? Usually it has to do with the condition of the clothing. So um, the goal is to put out stuff that's not heavily stained or torn or just in overall bad condition. Which is kind of unfortunate, right? Because these are things that could be repaired or cleaned. Um, and, and so how, how much stuff, well, what would happen to stuff that you decided not to put out on the floor? So... Basically, you would have this thing, it would be called the second store, and it's just a big gay lord, and you would just toss in any of the clothes that you weren't going to be putting out on the floor. And then how many of those gay lords would get filled in a day or week? I can't really come up with, like, a number for that off the top of my head, but, I mean, they would fill up really quickly. The clothing was pretty much always overflowing. It was a problem. Yeah, and then it would just, where it would get shipped off somewhere. Yeah, it wasn't always clear. Um, a lot of the time it does go to the bins, but I'm pretty sure that they sell it elsewhere. Did you see good stuff coming in? Yes, yes there was a lot of good stuff. That yeah, came there in. you go. There's good stuff. Without a doubt. First. Well, I was wondering about uh, Shop Goodwill and GoodwillFinds.com, which are the online arms of Goodwill. I was like, you know, how much stuff are they selling? Um, and I found out that Last year, uh, GoodwillFinds.com did more than $53 million in sales. Um, since its launch in October of 2022, which is so recent, they have sold more than 675,000 items. I mean, we're talking like a lot of stuff. So what I did find in my research, and I'm going to tell you that like, okay, first off, I'm just going to say I get really nervous about talking about Goodwill because every time I do these like goodwill ambassadors show up to fight with me and send their friends. Um, it's really weird. I, I I don't even, what is a goodwill ambassador? I don't know. I was Googling a bunch of stuff. I was trying to figure out like how many stores are sending this stuff? Like where's it going? What's the process? Nothing on the internet. What I did find is not every store in the goodwill army of stores sends stuff in, but more than 500 do. People on Thrift Grift who work, the subreddit once again, who work at thrift stores, various like Goodwill locations are saying that they're under a lot of pressure to meet a quota of things that they pool to send in every day. And that if they miss a pool to send to uh, Shop Goodwill online, uh, they'll get written up, right? So there's a lot of pressure to find this stuff. Did you ever feel anything like that? When it comes to shop goodwill, no, but just like the amount that you would have to put out on the floor, they would keep track of that. And you were supposed to get manager signatures for all the little slips, but we would just like sign each other's because no one could keep up with the quota. And do, so like, do you have an idea of like how much stuff came into your store every week? Um, like quantity? Just like, I don't know, were, the, were stuff getting donated every day? Was oh, it a yeah. lot? Oh, yeah. There was stuff donated every single day, and there were times where we would have to close down the donation center because there would not be enough room to safely walk in the back room because it would just be Gaylord next to Gaylord next to Gaylord. I mean, it was so filled both with wares, but especially clothing. You know, I uh, one person who wrote in to tell me about their experiences is uh, Trisha, who's also a thrift store employee. And she said, when I asked her how much stuff they would receive every week, she said, so much stuff. 
When I first started working there, we had a backlog of unsorted donations that looked like a mountain. It nearly went to the ceiling. On the weekdays, we get an average of a dozen people every two to four hours bringing in at least a trash bag full of items. And during college move out season, a great time to go dumpster diving, by the way, uh, we would get an insane amount of donations. We have two colleges in town. One has 10,000 undergrads and one 5,000 undergrads. Non-clothing items would stay on our shelves almost indefinitely. It's only when we're running out of space that we comb through the shelves and either reprice or completely get rid of items that were priced months ago. Clothes, however, are a different story. All clothing items have eight weeks to sell. Every few days, someone would be in charge of bailing, aka taking a section and checking the price tags of each item. If it's the, if the tag is labeled as more than eight weeks ago, then they have to be taken off the rack and disposed of. Um, and they would be put in a dumpster. Did you do something similar at Goodwill? Did you pull things? Nothing was ever put in a dumpster. However, yes, we would go through. Often it would be instructed as like, okay, pull all the black tags, pull all the purple tags, like whatever. Usually it would be like two different colors and you would just pull it all off, which is a lot of clothing, like a lot of clothing. Yeah. In completely good condition. Just pull it off the shelf, put in the second sort, sent off. Hopefully going to the bins where someone finds it, but I mean how many people are really going to the bins for all that clothing, right? I know. I mean, it freaks me out. So my job in Austin actually shared a parking lot with the Goodwill bins for Austin. And there was always something going on over there, right? In the parking lot in between. And uh, the meeting, the room where we would have all of our executive meetings, where we would get yelled at, they were terrible. I would just stare out the window and see what was going on at the bins and sometimes they would just bring out an entire cart of glassware and just start smashing it, which was way more entertaining than getting yelled at. But I would just see truck after truck pulling up and taking stuff away um, it, all day, every day. And they, as an added bonus, you know, every time they would back up, they would honk their horn for safety reasons. And the CEO of our company would start screaming about it all the time. It was rough at the time, but comedic now. So anyway, lots and lots of stuff coming in out of there. And that's just one place. Um, you know, just for uh, levity's sake, what's the grossest thing you've ever sorted through? <laughs> like it's a, it kind of depends like what category, because we could go with like bodily fluids or just like items in general that people <laughs> should not be donating. Because like, if you think of literally any single kind of item, it has been donated. People will donate anything. I mean, people will donate like dildos, grenades, guns, you know, <laughs> underwear that has, you know, someone had diarrhea in but what else I, are you gonna do with it yeah i mean you why would you throw away your perfectly good you know pooped in underwear <laughs> someone the pores need it you know yeah they need the pooped in underwear yeah yeah totally totally so i have another another it's interesting i do think that like for a lot of people who work in the secondhand clothing trade in rag yards in thrift stores there is this fear of like not being anonymous, right, when they speak out about it. So thank you, Dylan, for being so brave and being up here on the stage. But I got another great message from someone who works in a thrift store in another country, but in the global north, not in North America. Um, and they wanted to be, remain anonymous um, because there's so much pressure to be silent about this kind of stuff. And they said, to answer your questions, we are inundated with Shein and the like at our stores, but we still get some better pieces. Thrifting took off later here than in the U.S., but it's now very popular and the buyers are much younger. Management loves the young buyers because they are willing to pay up. Most items are about $5, better brands are about $12, and certain things can go up to $20. There are resellers here, but nothing like in the States. We get so much stuff, there's plenty to go around. As the sorter, I can tell you that we send out to recycling at least half of what we get every week. And that can be hundreds of three to five pound bags each week. The stores I work in aren't even the main uh, chain of charity shops here. There are literally tons of clothes being donated every month. It is unreal. Think about how many thrift stores there are out there, not just even here in the United States, and how much is being sent off somewhere else every single day. This is how we get to the six generations of clothing. 
It's like I try to close my eyes and picture it, and my brain just can't imagine what that much clothing looks like. It's pretty wild, right? Okay, well, how about we take some questions from the audience? Corey, you have another question, comment for us? Um, I don't know if anyone will be able to answer it, but I guess I'm curious, like, who's dropping off the Shein clothes? Like, if it's not people who have bought Shein and it's, like, a bulk amount, because, like, even at our thrift stores here, I'm seeing a lot of stuff from um, Zara, and I'm wondering who it is if you ask people or if, if it's like obvious based on what they're driving, because I can't imagine that people who work for those stores are just doing that in their own free time and that they're getting paid to do that. But how do you identify that if you can? Um, what do you mean? Like you're asking like the demographics of people who are dropping um, off this stuff? Or are you talking about like how like Salvation Army, for example, has like massive amounts of Yeah, Zara? like the massive yeah. drops. I mean, I think that, I'm pretty sure that like they're buying that stuff from Zara for a heavily discounted price, mm -hmm. but also like it, when, yeah, when you look at that Zara rack at Salvation Army, the clothes are miserable. Like they are in the worst condition <laughs> ever. I'm just saying like they're already falling apart just immediately. Yeah. I think it's unsold merchandise that these stores are relegating to those stores through contracts and possibly for tax write-offs for those stores. That's why you see the untagged uh, Target stuff all the time. And it's just what did not sell. So you'll see five of the same jumpsuit all tagged. That's from those stores. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, we were thrifting in uh, Lebanon recently. Shout out, great thrifting up there, by the way. Um, and we went into a local thrift store that I think is like one, one of one. And they had a ton in every department, even home goods from this brand that I can't, I'm blanking on the name right now, but they sort of sell themselves as like sustainable fast fashion, um, but it's really just Shein with a different name. Um, and it was in every single department there. And I was like, this is coming from them for sure. It was like comforters and curtains and duvet covers and clothes everywhere. I'm wondering if these, some of the corporate thrift stores, and this isn't you know, um, the independent small ones, but if some of these corporate thrift stores, it, that isn't their long-term goal to become more like Marshall's or something with these contracts, with these stores for their unsold merchandise to create kind of a more middle ground shopping experience rather than just donation based. I do wonder about that because certainly, um, it's a win-win for thrift stores and fast fashion brands because they get to write off that inventory and then these stores get to, yeah, pretend they're marshals, yep. right? It's so ubiquitous at this point. Dylan, did you ever, like, cause I've been to some Goodwills that had a ton of brand new Target stuff. I haven't seen it in a while, but was your store getting any of that? No, they didn't have any deal with anybody. Um, like all of the clothes that we got were donations. So yeah, we never had like the Zara, the Target section, but uh, you would get, you know, somebody donating a bunch of like tea public teas or like whatever, like, you know, online site that people are getting like uh, t-shirts made for like a one time event. And then they're just all donated. And then you have like 20 of these t-shirts for this really random specific event. Can I interject and ask if your um, Goodwill was rural or if it was in a metropolitan area? <laughs> kind of in between there it definitely wasn't rural for sure but I don't think that it's as big as some of the other ones sure I'm just wondering um as far as like allocation of the kind of target resale stuff etc so that's why I was just asking because I still see like if I go to the big goodwill here in Lancaster a ton of target stuff with the tag still on especially in the wear section actually so I do think that Either Target is dropping it off, which is entirely possible, or they're selling it off. I, I don't know, but it is weird. Or maybe corporate is sending it to specific cities, and then it's getting delivered to those city goodwill. Yeah. I, I don't, Once that's again, something to investigate. it's all shrouded in, in secrecy, like the whole secondhand yeah. trade is. And so it's hard to find the information. Okay, we have another question back here. 
name's Michelle and I live in Boise, Idaho. And um, our Goodwills are, are full of Target stuff. And there are other brands too, but uh, especially Target. There are uh, racks there in those huge Goodwill stores of just Target. Brand, even brand new with tags. Um, yeah, so something's, I'm always trying to figure it out too. Where, where did that come from? Oh, I think I saw that like, you know, eight months ago in Target, you know, <laughs> so. No, it's real. I mean, I definitely remember before the pandemic going to Target, even like in Portland, for example, and it would just be like a whole aisle of random stuff from Target. Like I bought a really nice pair of scissors actually one time. Um, it, there's definitely something going on there. I will say I want to piggyback on this idea of thrift stores, maybe trying to be like more like a Marshall's or TJ Maxx. And I want you to take this with a grain of salt, but once again, we're going to talk about thrift grift, number one subreddit. Um, people on there who are Goodwill employees and obviously like your experience as a Goodwill employee and what the policies are, they depend on what area you work in, right? But some people were talking about how they were actually like being instructed and being told that Goodwill, at least the ones they worked in, the intention is no longer to sell affordable clothing, that they want to sell more expensive things and that they really do want to become less associated with secondhand or low prices and more associated with just another discount store. And I think we could be seeing ourselves going like that's maybe that is what's happening here. Although I just want to say again, the Zara clothes at Salvation Army are abysmal <laughs> and there's so many. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Hi, um, I'm Laura. I'm from New Jersey. Um, uh, my, I was sort of formulating this thought as we've been talking and I'm wondering if... Um, some of the backlash, I guess, we're seeing against resellers or the reseller like sector is because um, they're sort of this site where we're like disrupting these like easy fix like myths we've been telling ourselves about how to like solve world problems. Like, oh, if I donate my free people to like a thrift store, then I'm like solving poverty, right? Like, <laughs> You know, or, you know, uh, I can't find, like, I can't afford good quality clothes because my wages are really low. I should be able to just go to, a, like, a thrift store and find something, but I can't because th that's not what people, you know, that's not what the world is c making right now. So I'm wondering, like, if you think that um, some of the anger against resellers is, like, that displaced frustration um, and they're, like, an easy target. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's that idea that like when you're donating something, it's going to go straight to the hands of somebody that needs it. <laughs> I mean, we've all liked to dream of that, right? I definitely have donated stuff in the past. Like, man, I am like a superhero, right? I just, I just gave someone all these sick Urban Outfitters clothes, right? <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that's a really good call out that unfortunately we're confronted by the reality that the system sucks. Yeah, it's all of us hating living within capitalism, and that's just being spewed out on the internet and directed at the wrong people. Outside of like an ethical or moral, moral dilemma, I do think that a little bit of the reseller hate is people just being mad that they didn't find that item themselves. Yeah. Like, Jealousy. I, I mean, like, it's true. Yeah. Like, they're just Jealousy. mad. Yeah. Dang, good call out. They're right there, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think it is very, it's emotional. That's what it really is. I mean, going off of what you said, I always find it so interesting that I see a lot of videos of a specific item and it's a great item. And someone's like, I just had the most amazing find in the thrift store. And then you immediately see comments of people that are like, you better not be selling that. Or, you know, yeah. if you are selling it, they're like, this is so messed up. You should have left it there. And it's really interesting because oftentimes if that item wasn't being presented in the way that you're seeing it online, you never would have gone for it. You know, it's like yeah, people don't know how to look outside of the context of the thrift store. Yeah. Cause you're also paying for the curation usually cause you know, different uh, resellers have different aesthetics. And when someone that like looks cool online is posting a video saying, look at this amazing thing, that's your perception. You're being presented something that someone is showing you as something cool and desirable. And then you have all of these comments reinforcing the idea that it's desirable. But when you're on your own and you're flipping through the rack, you could easily skip over it or you could not know what it was. You know, there are a lot of people out there when they're flipping through 
thousands of pairs of pants that don't know what makes a garment a 70s pair of pants, a 60s pair of pants. So if a reseller is online telling you, I found these amazing thrift store pants from the 70s, you're like, wow, that's so cool. But you wouldn't have necessarily been able to find those on your own. And then again, something that we talked about before is that if you the reseller was to leave something behind in the hopes that it gets found by the right person. There's so many tiny little things that have to add up perfectly for that right person to come along. So it has to be exactly the right size for the exact right person that has the budget for it, that wants that thing in that exact moment. And they're going to find that one rack in the store and pick up that one garment and buy it within that window, like you said, where things get pulled off the floor. So like you're saying, I'm going to leave this here. And in the next two days, that exact magical moment has to happen. Otherwise, it's just going to go and wherever things go, which we don't know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think you, you, you really nailed it right there. And I will say that, like, I recognize that as a re like, if you're a reseller, every, everything you do on the internet is under scrutiny and there's a lot of fear. And I just feel like, okay, you know, back when I was teaching small biz, big pick, and we had a lot of resellers in our classes and we were posting content about it on social media Every time we posted about pricing, okay, and the proper price of like how to determine the price of what you're selling, someone would show up. Now, not the same person every time, but the person, a, a different person who had the same thing to say, which was, well, I intentionally undercharge to keep things accessible and I just don't pay myself. And I think that there was this, I, I think that that kind of, uh, statement, uh, I hope isn't true. Um, cause why are you doing this then? But I think that kind of statement comes from the fear of people piling onto you. Right. And I similarly see people all the time saying, Oh, I, I leave most stuff behind because, you know, someone else can get it. And like you said, Alex, that someone else might never show up because the window is so short. Dylan, like for clothing, how long did it stay on the floor generally? It really depends um, because there would be stuff that I feel like would stay there for a while longer than other stuff. But, you know, I feel like when <sighs> there's a lot of donations, uh, clothing donations to the point where like it's overflowing in the back, um, we would be pulling stuff like sometimes every few days, like more than weekly. Um, so there would probably be items on there that wouldn't be out there much longer than a week. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that. And it's like almost too risky to leave it behind. Uh, does anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay, we'll come back to you, Stacey. I'm Bianca. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I don't know about you, but I always think of the landfill when I go to bed at night. And Same. I, it really it keeps me up and is very stressful. Yeah. Um, and then when I'm in the thrift stores, I think about where all these clothes are going to go that I am not buying. Um, and then there will be many clothes. I'm not a reseller myself, but I, you know, I'll see pieces that won't fit me or aren't a fit, good fit for me, but it's a great piece and I don't know what to do with it. And I do not want to leave it there because I know it's going to go in the trash. And then, you know, after, you know, 30 minutes of being at the thrift store, I have all these things that like, okay, I can't save these things for any reason. Anyways, um, working in a thrift store, um, what it, was your like emotional experience working there? with all of this overwhelming amount of clothing and, you know, I, seeing the reality of it, honestly, firsthand. I mean, I mean, it is really sad because like, I don't know, you just don't really realize like how much clothing people are just getting rid of all of the time until you're seeing it. Because like, for reference, like these gay lords, like they're taller than me. They're, you know, usually like four foot wide or something like that. They're like, these are, Huge, huge, huge uh, boxes of clothing. And we're probably changing them out several times a day. I mean, it's just horrible. It's also, a lot of people donated clothing that was just completely soiled. And I'm not just talking bodily fluids. I mean, like, just some of it was moldy. I mean, you would open a trash bag. It would smell so foul, just horrible. I do think there is this fantasy once again, that you donate your stuff and you just did your good deed of the day and someone else is going to get great joy from the stuff you dropped off. And we know that's just not the case. It's depressing, right? It's like, can we trust anything anymore? I start spiraling. When, after I'm done thinking about the landfill before I fall asleep, I start spiraling about that. Like, what other thing that I always believed is a myth, right? And, you know, the myth of donation is one of them. 
I think people also donate out of a way to keep it out of a landfill, even though it is so trash that it's giving people sorting it or going through the bins asthma, you know, like um, it can lead to health problems. But then rather than admitting to themselves that they created garbage, they think that they can just pawn it on goodwill. Yeah. Yeah. It's another form of denial. And that's really rough, you know, but I mean, also this makes us have to think about overconsumption in general and hoarding and things that are the dark things that we don't want to examine about ourselves. Yeah. So, you know, the best way to deal with that is to go on the internet and fight with people about resellers, right? Okay. Stacey, I know you had something. I have, a, I have a health and safety question for Dylan that might actually be hard to answer since you worked during the pandemic, but it's common practice when you're working in a rag house to wear a mask because there's so much lint in the air when you're tossing textiles around all day. Did Goodwill acknowledge that hazard? Nope. So Goodwill gives you, they give you a pair of gloves. You get gloves. And then um, if it weren't for the pandemic, I don't believe that masks would have been worn because we also had employees who did not want to wear masks and would do really try to not follow the mask mandate and just still sort even just like, you know, without any of that. And just like, obviously, you know, you have like all this stuff coming just from like moving around. But genuinely, I don't know what was on some of this clothing, but it was bad. I mean, it was it was so bad. You would just there are certain like bags that you would open and you're like, all right, the whole thing's going in the second sort because there's absolutely no way I'm going to be going through this. Um, Because, I mean, you'd open something up. First of all, all the clothes would be like yellowed. The cigarette smoke would be so strong. It just hits you in the face. They did have like another bin for stuff that was like hazardous, but it, it was mostly limited to stuff that, you know, was like underwear, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that. And I will say that um, since Dylan worked at the Goodwill, I've become like really obsessed with seeing when I go to other Goodwills what's going on. And I will often try my hardest to peek in the back. And I haven't seen anyone sorting wearing masks anytime recently. Yeah. So um, once again, the location of your Goodwill and what sort of like district it is will, I'm sure, make, make that answer different. But here in Pennsylvania, that seems to be like standard. Okay. We're going to be wrapping up a little bit here. So I want to see anyone else have a question, a comment. Okay. Come on over here. I'm glad you all stopped being shy. I have a comment and a question. Um, from working in um, consumer product development a handful of years ago, I learned that uh, non-core items at Target had a 30-day shelf life. So I think that was like what we were told let's say seasonal um, items. I worked in art and craft product development. So 30 day shelf life, I think they must have a very complex off off shelf resale system. Cause even in our independent consignment stores here, you see from Goodwill to um, independently owned the tagged target stuff. So, and that's home fashion, et cetera. So they're 30 days in and out. Um, and I have, well, I have another comment or question. I, I wonder if there would be less, and I don't know if this is U.S. based, um, where the terminology charity shop is used versus thrift shop. If there's less hate about like, oh, we, th- we are giving this, we're paying for this, this is a good cause. Um, if, if anyone is benefiting from this, this is good. I just think that's probably not research that's been done or like, what does the vernacular mean of thrift? the value of thrift versus the value of charity shop. That's just like what I was thinking about um, as you were bringing up some of your audience questions. Um, And then I have a question for y'all who are vintage dealers um, and resellers or brand owners in general, um, like yourself. Um, How do you balance uh, educating consumers or potential customers or educating the masses or how do you balance pursuing people who are who value what you do and marketing to them versus educating people who have the potential to get in that pipeline but might not but might only from an aesthetic standpoint be interested 
That's a really good question because I do know all the resellers I know do an awful lot of unpaid labor educating people. Like what, I mean, Alex, you send out a newsletter every week. Like what is your goal? Um, I know a big part of my, the reason that I started Substack. So I went to school for journalism. So I come from a writing background and I've kind of now been able to like come full circle back to that. Um, one of the big reasons that I really wanted to start it aside from wanting to get back into writing was that I needed a way to grow my brand and my business and monetize without necessarily selling more product. I feel like as a vintage dealer, there are kind of a couple paths you can take in terms of growing your business. Um, You can go brick and mortar, you can grow to a point where you need a team and you start outsourcing a lot of the labor to other people. And neither of those options really felt like the path I wanted to take forward. And you do get to a point where there is only physically so many garments that you can sort, process, and store yourself, especially as someone who lives in New York City. Um, I'm very lucky and my partner and I have a two bedroom apartment and everything lives in the apartment. Like I live with my inventory. And so there's a cap on how much stuff I can have have. Um, and so I really wanted to find a way to work within the vintage world and not necessarily have it mean taking on more and more access inventory. Um, and so the education component has kind of always been there for me. I'm very like deeply interested in history and garment history. We did an episode together about the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, which is one of my favorite vintage topics. Um, And so it's been really like awesome to be able to lean into that. And at the end of the day, I do feel like a lot of the educational components go hand in hand with the sales. I found that a lot of my customers are actually feel more connected to my brand and feel more connected to the garments I'm selling because of the educational components I'm able to provide. I feel like discussing with people where this stuff comes from, how it was made, the history behind the textiles, the brands, the garment workers uh, makes the item's more appealing, it makes them more interesting, it gives you more depth and a reason to understand why things are valuable and why they're priced the way that I have them priced. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And I know, Christine, you do a lot of education around like mending and laundry and whatnot. What is your like intention there? Like what is the ideal outcome that you're hoping for by providing that unpaid labor and that education to others? Well, with um, mending and laundry, that's about preserving garments and keeping the life of the garment going longer than what we would normally want to do. Um, And then I've been doing a lot of classes about denim and fit with jeans because I see that like I've had experiences myself and then witnessed people almost brought to tears with trying on jeans. And so I love sharing information to empower people um, and I'm, I'm not a fan of gatekeeping. So, you know, if people want to come to me and ask me questions about thrifting and vintage, I'm more than happy to share it. Um, because I, you know, I, it, the community has grown so much since the pandemic. Um, and a lot of people can say, oh, it's, you know, there's so much competition, but I think everybody has such an individual eye and niche and I can be picking at the bins or at a thrift store or whatever next to four other vintage dealers. And I can guarantee you we'll, we will each leave with different carts and all happy. Yeah. Like I, as Amanda constantly says, and this is one of my favorites community over competition. Yes. Yes. Brenda, so true. Brenda, Brenda. <laughs> I feel like this is also cool because this kind of brings us full circle to everything. So you said that a big component of laundry and mending is about preserving garments. And I feel like all of the vintage dealers I know and the secondhand sellers that are the most passionate and are driven by a love and a desire to preserve the garments and the history more than they are about making money. Um, It's like we love all of the vintage. So it's not just the vintage that I have or that I'm selling. I care very deeply about other people's personal collections. I care very deeply about the clothing that other dealers are selling. And so by spreading this information, you're really protecting all of it. 
it because it's a limited resource at the end of the day. And it also goes back to the thrift store. Like when I see other resellers piling up their cart with tons of vintage, that's all vintage that's being rescued from the landfill. And I understand that it could be disappointing for someone to go in and be like, I didn't find these pieces because someone took them. But that means that they're going into the hands of someone who knows what they're doing, who knows how to take care of them and is able to bring them to the right person who's much more likely to preserve them, keep them in circularity. And like at the end of the day, again, they're a limited resource. There's only so much vintage out there. And as these decades get further and further away, it's dwindling. And a lot of these things are ending up in the landfill, whether we like want that to happen or not. And so preservation is absolutely like a core value and is kind of how all of this is really interconnected. Yeah, I can totally agree with that, that it is, it's about preservation recognizing the value of clothing, no matter how long it's been around or how much the original owner paid for it. It's also about community and it's also about education. And I think that's a really great place for us to wrap it up today because this is what we've been doing all weekend at the Jamboree is really building community while also sharing knowledge and educating one another and getting ready to go back out into the world and educate and communicate and build connections with the people who live where we live, right? Who are in our sphere of influence. Because ultimately, as we started here tonight, we need less people fighting about secondhand on the internet, and we need a lot more people buying secondhand first, right? And where we're, how we're gonna get there is by having these conversations with other people, speaking up when we see people sharing misinformation. Once again, all of these anti-reseller myths, they're just someone's opinion that they gave one time and somehow it got repeated across the internet a gazillion times and I hope they got royalties for that. But it's like, this stuff is not fact but people hear it so often it becomes fact. And that's where we come in with the real message, with the real facts that we repeat over and over again to people who will then repeat them over and over again to other people. And then guess what? Those become the facts. And I can't wait for a moment where I see constant epic long comment threads on Instagram and TikTok that are like, Man, I'm so grateful for resellers, shopping secondhand rolls. I'm so glad people save stuff from landfills. I'm glad people deal with poopy Spider-Man underwear at the thrift stores, and we should be good to thrift store workers too. I can't wait for a moment where that's the conversation we see on a post about thrifting and not all this other nonsense. So thank you to everybody who came out tonight to join this conversation, to hopefully go bust some myths with the people in your life. I'd love to thank again, let's give a round of applause to our amazing guests, Alex, Christine, Dylan. I wanna thank everyone who came out to the Jamboree, all the volunteers who helped us. This would not have happened without a whole team of incredible volunteers. I'm so grateful for your time and your effort. And of course, last but never leastly, Mr. Dustin Travis White for our music, our audio support all of his great help this week. Um, thank you so much, and I hope you have a great evening. You wanna take a bow? Take a bow. <laughs>